Hello and welcome back to Miss Hannah Loves Grammar. In this video, we'll be putting a spotlight on Robert Louis Stevenson, in particular, his influences, his intentions, and ultimately, what his impacts were with the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. When I consider his influences, I'm commenting on life experiences that may have led to him subconsciously or consciously considering what became his intentions. Let's consider first and foremost, his struggle with the Christian faith. He was raised in a very traditional Christian home, and by the time he became an adult, he made the decision he did not believe in God. By becoming an atheist, he clearly had some beef, if you like, with the societal obligations to being a Christian. So this novella poses some fascinating moral questions that in many ways might be forcing a reader to question their faith further. Stevenson was by his trade a lawyer. He knew how to signpost a statement and argue a case. And it's fascinating because this novella is illogical, not like his style would have been as a lawyer. Here, his novella applies logic to try and understand the mess of its characters' lives. And this seems to be flawed because we don't get that much closer to understanding the mess of these characters through this approach. You could argue this might be due to the very circumstance with which he wrote the, this text, which I'll come on to in a moment. He was also fascinated by science as a way to manage the human condition, the human mind and the human body. And he was a witness to this across his life. He was an invalid across his life and even had to manage his tuberculosis and other ailments with the use of drugs. In particular, he used uh, medicinal cocaine, as it was called at the time, to manage tuberculosis. Yet the novella shows the ingenuity of a mad scientist and science trying to solve problems as a dark fascination. He also struggled more widely with drugs than just for medicinal purposes. He fell out with his father for his wild ways and antics, in particular the use of the opiate drug laudanum. And the novella charts the decline of a drug user, Dr Jekyll, a respectable man falling down by using the impulses that taking this drug, making him turn into Mr Hyde, um, makes him live out. He lived out his pleasures, that's Stevenson for you, with abandon in an unrestrained fashion for his time, something that I'm confident Victorians would have thought was utterly disgusting and bawdy and rough. Yet the novella depicts a man who's hated for his impulses and selfish desires, Mr Hyde. So, in essence, these are just random parallels, but they do serve to show that there are things floating around in our writer's life that in some way push them on to questioning the world around them. Now, the actual circumstances that he claims he wrote this novella are fascinating. He was in a drug-induced nightmare. He was suffering from the riddles of tuberculosis. And he's in a drug-induced um, state in his Bournemouth home with his wife. Now, his wife woke him up because he was uh, a mess, by the sounds of it. And he was really annoyed she'd woken him up because he sought to relive that dream that nightmare over the next three days, writing around 10,000 words each day in a frantic state. And it's interesting to note that when he then shows it to his wife, very happy with what he's created, she is so disgusted she throws it in the fire. <laughs> wow, that's some bad blood in that marriage. Another insight into what Stevenson thought of his novella comes in the form of his letter to his friend William Lowe, the illustrator. He says, I send you here with a gothic gnome, interesting I think, and he came out of a deep mine where he guards the fountains of tears. Here we get a glimpse at how Stevenson toiled and suffered at the creation of Jekyll and Hyde. The phrase deep mine conjures up the image of buried emotion. The fountain of tears hints at sorrow and suffering. The image of a gothic gnome may have slightly different connotations from our usual understanding of a gnome. In this instance, a gnome is an ugly small person and a gothic gnome at that suggests there's some dark undertones at what we will read. He goes on to say in his letter, P.S. The gnome's name is Jekyll and Hyde. 
I believe you will find he likewise quite willing to answer to the name Lowe or Stevenson. Here we have proof, if you like, that we as readers are meant to find direct parallels between Jekyll and Hyde and us. The fact he says Jekyll and Hyde can go by the name of Lowe or Stevenson may mean that these flawed facets of the protagonist are the same in the writer and his friend as they are in us. It's a great opportunity in this short glimpse of a letter to understand the somewhat troubled mind of our writer, whose passion to understand what he's creating highlights how much he knows you cannot be at peace with yourself and how that is a central facet to his novella. Of all the intentions that Stevenson had, there are some that were more pressing than others, and the most pressing need of all was his financial position. He chose to write a shilling shocker, and I think that's because there was a huge amount of financial pressure on he and his wife at the time of writing this novella. A shilling shocker was simply a crime story that you paid a shilling to read, and I think he needed the money. But there are broader, more pressing needs that run alongside the fact that it was a shilling shocker, like the questions that it asks us that are moral and philosophical, perhaps in keeping with his atheist stance, he's challenging Christian ideals around what the nature of evil is. Why do we have urges to do bad things? He's proving that the binary good and evil ideology is flawed. We learn in this novella that Good Dr. Jekyll has a dark side and he becomes more evil as he creates Hyde, not the other way round. We definitely get the words of a wild child with that sentiment because we're asked the question, can anyone ever be completely pure? And the answer is resoundingly no by the end of this novella. The interrogation of Victorian society and their pretensions around respectability is undeniably the focus of this novella. The whole premise of duality, that gothic facet that we've come to and we'll consider again in other videos, is questioning if it's ever respectable to have repressed desires that lead you to do bad things or commit crimes. Secrecy to Stevenson is a sign of hypocrisy in the way he narrates Jekyll anyway. And in many ways, he is attacking society, saying what in society is provoking this good man to do evil? The fact he's not allowed to be. The fact we're never shown the actual crime that Jekyll is committing leads us to other theories that Stevens is saying we're just not that tolerant, actually. And we know that Stevenson was quite a bohemian character. But equally, Stevenson is pushing us to reflect on the impact of addiction. Perhaps that's because it was something at the heart of his life. Like, what drives someone to addiction? Why do it, people fall from grace when they are addicted? Stevenson's impact with this novella was instant. It was a hit. It took him out of his difficult financial position and people described it as striking and astonishing. One critic even went so far as to say Stevenson has gone far deeper than the masterpieces of Poe. Now Edgar Allan Poe was and is one of the most prolific gothic writers of all time. So the idea that Stevenson may have done as well as one of the masters was a high praise indeed. Yet others remarked that there was irrelevancy of the story. A bit like his wife, of course, who described it when she first burnt it as utter nonsense to a friend. To others, it was totally shocking. Too much to show drug dependency and not something that Victorians should be reading about at all. Yet it's interesting to note that Stevenson was completely conflicted uh, by this great reception that he got from Victorian high society. And actually, he saw it as a mark of failure across his life that he couldn't flag their hypocrisy and instead they enjoyed reading his novella. He said to his friend, the literary critic Edmund Goss in a letter, that fat 
fatuous rabble of burgesses called the public. God save me from such irreligion. That that way lies disgrace and dishonour. There must be something wrong in me or I would not be popular. So there we have it. He describes them as fatuous rabble of burgesses. That means they're highly privileged, silly little people with pointless ideas. The idea that it's upsetting to him that he'd be popular, therein lies our plagued and troubled writer. His impact has far lived his lifetime. His influences are fascinating and his intentions, well, they're for you to decide whether you agree or not. Why not subscribe to Miss Hannah Loves Grammar for all things English, literary and grammatical?